Hey, Jenny, how you doing? Sunday of Lent, our readings are taking us closer to Holy Week and our celebration of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so today we hear in the Gospel reading that the Son of Man must be lifted up even as the snake in the wilderness. And we will get to remember that hear it again, the snake in the wilderness in Numbers, and then how Jesus uses that episode in Israel's history to teach Nicodemus in John chapter 3. We'll be having a, the recorded music today, so uh, remember sometimes it takes a minute for the music to get going, but it'll be there if you give it a time. Uh, so we rise to begin with confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have not done, we have not loved you in our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die. For his sake, he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is my life and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though the war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek out. And I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his sins. He will lift me high upon a rock. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid?
The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Lent is from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from the Son of Man, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our text, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now for four weeks, it was a number one top billboard song. But now it is considered the worst song of all time. Ten years ago, the magazine Rolling Stone polled the question, and the results were not even close. They said it was one of the biggest blowouts in every poll they'd ever done in their history. The band's bassist, Pete Sears, looking back, said, well, that album for me was musical hell. I joined the band in 1974, and gradually the music 
had become vacuous, sterilized, escapist. It was an embarrassment. We had band meetings with big arguments. I probably should have tried harder to oppose it. I had a family. So one of the band's vocalists, Grace Slick, agrees that in her words, the song is the worst song ever. The song, the Starships We Built This City. For a year and a half, Starship was a number one hit assembly line, building their city on rock and roll. They had Sarah and nothing's going to stop us now, which in classic rock and roll irony did stop their chain of hits. <laughs> their biggest hit, We Built This City, is still making money and it was once licensed for over a million dollars, excuse me, nearly a million dollars. So whose word do we take for it? Is it a good song or is it the worst song? Reviews of the Lord's bread from heaven have also soured over the years. Exodus 16 records the first time that the, mar the manna appeared. And Israel had gotten out into the wilderness and they'd kind of gotten over the euphoria of we got out of slavery. And suddenly they looked around at their camp stores and said, hmm, where are the Egyptian meat pots and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic? and the fish that cost nothing. A dozen or so miracles in, they had not yet come to the conclusion that God would provide for them. And you can hear the laughter in the name that they give to this miracle bread that appears in the wilderness for them. They called it manna, which means, what is that? It was as new as a sin clavier in the mid 1980s. Now, 20 years had to pass from we built this city going number one to the first snarky article fixing its worst status ever, excuse me, worst song ever status. Uh, you know, we get tired of even the best number ones. If you think about it, uh, going four weeks is a pretty decent run. The longest a song ever goes number one in a row is 19 weeks. It's only happened once. The Israelites had to eat manna in the wilderness for 40 years, 40 years the same food. The Old Testament reading number 21 relates to us the end of that time period. It tells us the seventh time Israel rebelled against God and Moses during those wanderings. Most of the time when they complained, God said, okay, I'll give you something. Let's keep going. But the customer is not always right or our relationship with God is not even close to that of a customer and a corporation. So when Israel moved from just Egyptian melon nostalgia to actually describing the lifeline that was the daily manna as worthless food in our region, the heavenly response changed. It's important in our understanding of our Old Testament reading to recognize how slow to anger the Lord is with his people. It's the seventh rebellion that we're reading about. Proverbs 14, 29 says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. And that phrase, the Proverbs has hasty temper. It's the same words in our reading that get translated narratively as Israel grew impatient on the way. They had a hasty temper. Or uh, you wanna go for a more literalistic translation. It's they made their shorts Excuse me. They made their souls short. The indulgence of prankiness, you see, isn't just unpleasant for the people who are around us. It does something to our own souls. It shortens us. It lessens us. It makes us small. Calling God's lifeline worthless is not something that happens overnight. Like the erosion of a beach, it takes time. It doesn't happen with one single water molecule hitting one grain of sand but we talk to one another. And as we talk to one another, our words begin to create currents that begin to erode or to build up. As we say things are frustrating to us, that language begins to build. Or if we say, that's a good thing, I wanna hear it on the radio, that ends up building a song up to number one. 
So we could spend time during this sermon talking about the gift that Grace Slick had for singing and performing, and maybe someone would go back and listen to some of her work from Jefferson Airplane in the 60s, and then you'll sit there and wonder how the same woman could sing White Rabbit and We Built This City, and that might tempt you to say something bad about We Built This City. If you do decide to join that current of attacking we built this city along with millions and millions of people. Who knows where that will go, right? Who f each time we have to complain about something, it's like an earworm, like one of those songs that you can't get out of your ear. The complaint gets turned up a little bit in volume every time you pass it on. You say, you know, I don't really like that song that was number one for four weeks. And I think, that's true, I'm gonna go tell somebody else the same thing, except when I tell them, I turn it up and I say, you know, it's not that I just don't like it, it's just a bad song. I mean, why do they have a DJ talking over the middle of the song? And then you repeat that to the next person and they turn the volume up a little bit more and it's not just it's a bad song, it's you realize that's the worst song of all time. The same thing happens with the manna, right? You go from, oh, I'm tired of eating manna, there was no new recipes. What else are we going to do with it? Then the volume gets turned up. Man, it's just not good anymore. I'm not sure it's even of the same quality as when it first came. And then you turn it up a little more. Manna is the worst. Now, hold on a second. Manna is worthless food. It's literally miracle bread. It's bread that has come down from heaven. You've heard of bread being break, baked with love as being the best kind of bread? Well, this is bread baked with love by God himself who looks upon you and sees your need and your hunger and says, I'll give them something sweetened with honey. It has sustained the people of Israel to the point where their shoes do not wear out, their bellies are not empty, and they don't have to slave in order to get this food. They just get it because they're beloved children. To call it worthless is delusional. But how do we get to delusional falsehoods? We grumble together. And we keep turning the volume up on our grumbles. When the Lord sends snakes to strike the grumblers, it's not just because snakes were the first thing at hand. You think, oh, I'm mad. I'm going to get them. Oh, there's a snake. I'll throw snakes at them. No, he has a point for what he's doing. There's a lesson. The snake is a symbol of Egypt. When Moses and Aaron first went and confronted the Pharaoh, it was a battle of stabs turning into snakes. Where Moses and Aaron's snakes, stabs, ate the snakes of the Egyptians. And what's on the crown of the Pharaoh but a snake that says this is the symbol of Egypt's power. So they wish they had the life they had in Egypt. Well, let's remind them what life was like under the snake. What it felt like on their backs when they didn't get their quota of bricks. When you say that the snake is lifted up on the standard, it's saying two things at once. It says, okay, this is the life you think you wanted. Is that the life you want to go back to, the snake in Egypt? Here's what Egypt really is, what it was to be slaves. But it also says at the same time, this is a defeated snake. The Lord who brought you out of Egypt has defeated your worst enemies, has defeated your enslavers. So as they turn to look at the snake, they are both repenting of the old, wrong, deceitful desires, but they're also turning to follow their victorious lover, to go with him who will triumph over even the original serpent tempter, the one who brought us into sin and deceitful desires in the first place. Follow him who defeats our true enemies. That is the meaning of the serpent on the pole. And all this plays into our gospel reading as Jesus discusses with Nicodemus repentance, being born again, and how the Son of Man must be lifted up. See, the Pharisee leader has come to Jesus at night. While Jesus was drawing crowds, the elites hated him and grumbled about him. And Nicodemus was part of that community where the grumbling was going around and around in the echo chamber of the Sanhedrin. And Nicodemus doesn't come in the daylight hours when the crowds were coming to see Jesus and the grumblers would have looked and said, what is Nicodemus doing going and talking to that Jesus? And Jesus knows who Nicodemus is. He knows when he says the Son of Man must be lifted up, he knows it's the Sanhedrin who will call him a blasphemer and put him in that position to be crucified. So Nicodemus is told very clearly by Jesus, 
that the grumbling crowd will not see the kingdom of heaven. Just like the grumblers from Numbers didn't make it into the promised land, but had to die with the older generation outside. He says, you have to die to self. You have to repent. You have to be born again of water and the spirit. And Nicodemus is lost in all this. He says, how can a man be born again? How does this work? Well, Jesus is answering that question in the section of John 3 that we heard this morning. He's saying that being born of water and the spirit is not just a meaningless rite, but it connects us to the world-changing reality of his death and his resurrection. He gives his death and resurrection and righteousness and new life to us so that when we go under the water, our old Adam, the old grumbler dies, and we are raised to new life in Jesus' resurrection. Jesus didn't just come to be bread from heaven, though he is that. He didn't just come to teach as a good rabbi, though he is also that. He says, I have come down as the great judge from on high, the son of man, who has come not to condemn as judge, but to stand in the seat of accusation with you and be condemned in your place. When we grumble against our leader, this is part of what's going on in both John 3, where Jesus is being grumbled against, and in Numbers, where Moses is grumbled against. We're not really telling anybody anything new about the leader. Look, we all know what our complaints about our leaders are. It's apparent because they're out front leading. What grumbling about the leader does is it reveals the shortness of your own soul. And Jesus hears not just the words of grumbling, I don't like my leader. He hears that shortness. To heal us, he says, let's play it all the way out. Let's turn the volume all the way up to 11 right now. He says, all right, you want to condemn your leaders. Well, God is your leader from on high who sends your leaders to you. You want to grumble against God. You want to condemn God. You want to do the full return to sender on your leader and give him a shameful death. Here I am and will be lifted up. Just like the snake on the pole said, do you really want to go back to Egypt? The son of God on the cross says, you really want to dethrone God? Well, here I am. Do with me as you will. And it doesn't just say here. Here is your chance to condemn the judge. Here is your chance to overthrow the leader. It says so much more than that, because while we love the darkness and love to grumble in the darkness, God still loves the world. He looks past the shortening of our soul to see the fullness of soul that will come in restoration and new creation. God gives his son. So that word give, it doesn't stop appearing. It keeps appearing again and again, even in the moment where you've had the seventh rebellion and God finally has to send the snakes to say, you crossed the line this time. He still gives even in that moment. Sixty-three times the word give appears in the Gospel of John. Sixty-three times John says, God gives to you. And how many times is 40 years times every day and enough on the day before the Sabbath that they could have a day of rest and not have to gather? God gave bread day after day, and he is still giving you good things, not just bread for daily life. He gives you life and love and so many other things that we could be thanking him for all the time. And when instead of thanking, we're grumbling, guess what he's still doing? He's still giving. Each moment that we spit the curses of salt water, grumbling, God says, I love you. And I still will give you something good that you could fill your mouth with thanksgiving for. And to condemn something, it makes us feel like we're able to stand over it. Like we're able to say, oh, I could make a better number one hit song. Just put me in my garage and give me a little tape deck to record myself. Surely that'll go number one. You read some of these articles. There've been a number of these that have now been written about how bad we built this city is. And you get the sense that maybe some of the people in that band are a little tired of the old joke. Yeah. How easy is it to go out and create a number one hit song that people want to listen to again and again? The condemning is just a miserable sense of superiority. It's what the devil thinks being God is like, and we shouldn't take his word for it. 
Because Jesus shows us that God would rather stand in our place, take our condemnation in order to give one more gift if we would drive the nails home. Giving is what God is really like. When we look on Jesus lifted up, we see that while we loved the darkness and tried to put out the light of the world, God also triumphs over our enemies for us. We come back to the thing that we had once called worthless, and we taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, ten years after the world decided we built this city is the worst ever, a British mobile service cut a hilarious ad with a little girl riding her bicycle, singing the song, belting it out, arms up in the air. It ends with the tagline, we all need silly stuff, which I have no idea how it sells cell phones, but I'm not British and I'm not grumbling about it. The ad went viral over there. And so we built this city, made it back onto Britain's top 25 songs once more, because people felt free to love something silly. And they did love it. The co-writer of the song, Martin Page, said when he saw how it turned, and people loved the song again, he was on the verge of tears. I think it feels good, as the small catechism says, to speak well of our neighbors, to defend them, to explain everything in the kindest way to keep turning the volume up on praising the good things in this world, even if they're just good and being silly. It feels good because we're made in the image of God. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now may the peace of God surpass all understanding. Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise to confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed.
The Lord God, you have set Joseph, our president, and Andy, our governor, as authorities over us for our good. Bless and sustain them with all they need to govern us wisely, that we might be ruled with goodness, justice, and accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, you are our light and our salvation. Hide and shelter all those who ask for our prayers, all who suffer in body, mind, or soul. Keep them in their day of trouble from falling into faithful spirit. Uphold them with your peace in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Congregation may be seated. I'm going to thank Charlie for working through that. I am the one who told we were on setting three. So that's on me. Please don't grumble about it too much. Uh, other announcements people want to bring to our attention? Well, we have been begun talking about what we will do for Bible study when we get to past Easter. Um, will we have a desire to do some Bible studies in person? Will the weather be good enough? Maybe we can do some outdoor Bible study. Uh, or we'll go back to doing some Zoom Bible studies. We need feedback from you. Let us know how you would like to participate because uh, we want to make sure that we are able to provide those services for uh, anybody who's interested in we have a good conversation. We learn a lot from God's Word when we do Bible studies. So we're eager to get it going in some format and figure out what the best format is. Any other announcements for us? All right, God's blessings on your week.